Good morning. Let's sing together. Good morning again, and welcome to Cornerstone Faith Community Church. We are so glad to be gathered together with you this morning. Worship team, you can probably be seated. <laughs> and uh, I'm not exactly sure what the right greeting for today is, but I think it's Happy Rally Day.
So uh, maybe I'm not sure exactly what the right greeting is, happy rally day, whatever, but I do know what the right response is, and it's a great big woohoo. So let's give a great big woohoo. Woo All right. It is so good to be gathered together this morning and to celebrate our kids. And uh, I don't know if you see this or not, but like the first three rows is pretty much all kids this morning. And that's uh, such a great reason to be excited. And there's still more. We have kids in the back. We have kids on the side. It's such a great, great uh, day to be celebrating the next generation uh, uh, and what God is doing here at Cornerstone Faith Community Church. Um, I do want to just quickly say this. Uh, Friday, as uh, Carol Cosentino and I were putting all of this together, we were talking about what God has done uh, in the life of this church over the last year or so. And a year ago at this time, we were having a conversations that went like this. Well, do you think maybe we could try Sunday school? Do you think maybe it's time for us to kind of get back at it after COVID? Do you think maybe we could get the families back? Uh, let's start with once a month. That's what we did last summer. Let's start with uh, maybe we could try twice a month. And as I looked at the fall calendar of events for last year, we were so excited to have Children's Ministry Hour first and third Sundays. And here we are just a year later, we have every Sunday, and we have gone from essentially zero to 10, 12, sometimes 14 kids. I think that's a reason for a woohoo this morning, right? Yeah, it's, it's amazing. It is so amazing to see what God is doing in this place. And yes, we're all, we all have busy schedules. Some weeks we have two, some weeks we have 14. We're thankful for whatever we have each and every week we have them. And so this morning is a celebration of that. And it is looking forward to what God is going to do in the next 365 days. Who knows? Maybe three rows won't be enough, right? Uh, that, that is our hope and our, our anticipation that God is that big and God is that good and he can do that. So this morning, as we prepare for that, the first thing that I want to do is introduce to you the people that make this possible. And so we're going to start this morning by bringing forward Lane Camps. Lane um, is our um, council representative for uh, Sunday School. He is the uh, Christian education moderator for Sunday School. And um, that's just basically a fancy way of saying he makes sure that Sunday School happens, that Christian education happens in this place, not just for Sunday School, but also for adult education. Um, it is his responsibility as a council member to make sure that um, I'm providing Christian education opportunities for you, that Sunday school is happening. And uh, so between myself and Carol Cosentino, who we're going to talk to in just a moment, um, he makes sure that all of that happens. So let's give a shout of praise to the Lord for Lane. <laughs> Carol, would you please come up? Carol Cosentino, who is in her like one billionth year of being the... Uh, uh, <laughs> she's only 40, yes, the Sunday school um, coordinator for, for Cornerstone Faith Community Church. And um, uh, just by show of hands, um, how many people in this room uh, have had Carol Cosentino at some point in their life for, for, for Sunday school? Look at all of those hands of various different ages, by the way. <laughs> Um, this, is the, this is the impact of Carol in our Sunday school. Um, and so at one point, you didn't make it through the preschool room in this building without having gone through Carol's room. Um, now, uh, you know, we have an intergenerational Sunday school, but Carol coordinates all of our Sunday school. And so we give thanks to God for all of her work as well. So from a veteran person who has lots of years of ministry under her belt to a newbie, a, a newborn, if you will, in, in, in children's ministry. Jen, will you come up? Jennifer, will you come up? Uh, Jennifer Schacht has maybe foolishly, no, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> 
Jennifer Schacht has recently just agreed to participate with our children's ministry as the coordinator of our toddler room. Um, I am very excited to say that our toddler room will reopen officially next week. Our, our hope and our plan with God's help and with your help will be that we will have the toddler room staffed every Sunday, meaning that we will have a place for our youngest um, learners and our youngest Jesus followers to be cared for and, and, and loved each Sunday um, in that beautiful room that we spent so much time and resources putting together a couple of years ago. And so Jennifer is going to be coordinating that. Um, and uh, there are some faces out there, right, that are going to be getting a phone call this week to see if you would like to maybe help her along the way. Um, we can't do that without you. Um, there, are, there are legal ramifications of that. We have to have two people in the room at all times. That's a lot of people, and we want to put some teams together. So uh, if your phone rings and it comes up as Jennifer Shocked, please answer it. <laughs> um, but let's give a shout of praise to the Lord for Jennifer and for her willingness as well. Now, at this time, Carol, why don't you take that microphone? Because I'd like for you to bring up all of our Sunday school teachers, if you would. You're already on. Have everybody come forward. All of our Sunday school teachers, if you're a Sunday school teacher or a helper, or a helper. for Sunday school or a sub of any way, <laughs> please come forward. Yep. You guys can just line up all right here, please. You can go right here. <laughs> we have four teaching teams. And that enables us to attend worship three weeks out of the month. That's real important to us. We need to be in here as often as we can. So we have four dedicated teaching teams. They are Lane and Monica. They teach one week. Carol is going to be teaching with Marilyn. Uh, Sue Matula taught with uh, Marilyn and she is now going to be our substitute so Carol has graciously stepped in to help Marilyn and we have Lori Letts and Kathy um, they are teaching together we have four great teams we sometimes teach with each other if if one of our teaching partners can't you, teach. you skipped your daughter Oh, and my daughter. <laughs> oh, yeah. Lisa and I teach together. <laughs> We've been teaching together a long time. Lisa has taught with me um, through high school. She started when I was a, a teacher here, and um, so she's still teaching with me today. So we are so blessed to have dedicated teachers, but we're also looking for new people. So if you can find it in your heart to step forward and maybe be a helper or a teacher, we would, or a substitute, we would love to have you join our team. As a matter of fact, we have a meeting tomorrow night. <laughs> at 6.30, we are doing our scheduling through the end of the year. We'd love to have you come and just see if it's something you'd be interested in doing. We'd love to have you join us, so. For sure. There you go. Excellent. <laughs> stay here, stay here. Folks, um, would you please join me in a word of prayer as we ask God to bless our Sunday school teachers. Father, we thank you so much for raising up this team of teachers. Um, and Lord, we are so thankful for their willingness to reach into the hearts and the lives of the next generation of Jesus followers in this place. Father, thank you for their, their diligence to your word and thank you for their willingness to honor you and your call in their lives. We pray that you will keep them faithful to your word, that you will keep them faithful to the children of this congregation. And Father, we pray that you will bless this ministry, that it will be something that helps to raise up a strong and faithful next generation of Jesus' people in this place. Father, we thank you for this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. All right, now, teachers, if you need to go have a seat, you're certainly welcome to do that. Otherwise, if you want to just take a step to the side, at this time, we're going to invite all of our Sunday school students to come on forward. So if you are a Sunday school student, please come on up. 
All right, guys, if you want to make a line right up here, please. Okay. All right. You can do it, Layla. All right. Perfect. Moms are welcome, too. <laughs> All right, excellent. Now, the Sunday school students have a special surprise for us, I think, right? You guys are going to sing for us, is that right? I'm going to get out of the way so your parents can sing. Okay, Miss Roz, can you start us? Okay. Here we go. Jesus love. sing with us. Yes. Okay, now for the moment we've all been waiting for. Some of you have been asking me, what in the world is a balloon praise parade? Well, you're about to find out. Oh! <laughs> all right. All right. All right. Okay. Now, congregation, congregation, on the screens, you're going to see the words to Jesus loves the little children. As the little children parade around the sanctuary, will you please join in singing together with us? second. Hold on a second. We're not there yet. Here we go. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the in his sight. Jesus cares for all the children of the world. Jesus died for all the children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus died for all the children of the Can we get a round of applause?
and sing with us as we continue our worship this morning. The book of Isaiah, chapter 64. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you. As when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil, come down to make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. Since ancient, ancient times, no one has heard, nor no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you 
who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. You come to the help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. But when we continue to sin against them, you were angry. How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the winds, our sins sweep us away. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have given us over to our sins. Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the day. You, we are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be angry beyond measure. Lord, do not remember our sins forevermore. Oh, look on us, we pray, for we are all your people. Your sacred cities have become a wasteland. Even Zion is a wasteland. Jerusalem, a desolation. Our holy and glorious temple, where our ancestors praised you, has been burned with fire, and all that we treasured lies in ruins. After all this, Lord, will you hold yourself back? Will you keep silent and punish us beyond measure? Jesus Christ. 
Father, we thank you for this great day that you've given to us. And we thank you for mercy, Father. We thank you that you do have mercy on us. That as we bow our knee before you, as we humble our hearts before you, as we confess our sins before you, you are good. You hear our prayers and you have mercy on us. As far as the east is from the west, so far do you remove the sin of those who earnestly and truly repent. And so, Father, this morning we say thank you. Thank you for that mercy. Thank you for that forgiveness. Father, thank you for Jesus who loves us so. Father, we pray this and we thank you for this in his name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning once again. And again, what a great day it is to celebrate our children. Did everybody enjoy that this morning? Yeah. Don't forget the party continues afterwards down in the Beacon Room. We have a 25 or 30 foot ice cream sundae for you, as well as um, pie the pastor. But don't forget, you got to cough up the dough if you're going to pie the pastor today. So, okay. Um, but I'll see you down there. And uh, don't forget that all the money that comes in today, any donations that are given, um, go to our Sunday school, go to the operating fund so that we can continue to make sure that we have um, everything we need for our future generation. So thank you in advance for today and for everything that you have done for us so that we can continue to meet the needs of our children. Um, other things that are coming up in the life of our church, um, Trunk or Treat is coming up uh, next month, uh, October 28th. That happens. Um, don't forget that you can sign up on the office on my office window if you would like to help us with donations for that. Thank you to folks who have already signed up and some have already um, given their donations. We appreciate that. Um, some people were asking about, um, they were still a little confused about whether they were buying those things or they were just giving a check and then the church is buying those things. Um, the idea is that you can put a check or cash in the envelope and then the church will buy all of those things um, at one time. So we don't need you to go out and find those things. Um, we're just asking for the money to purchase those items. If, uh, if you're donating candy, you can do either or. You can either give us money and say, you guys go buy the candy, or you can buy the candy and bring it to us. Either way is fine. Doesn't matter. That's the trunk or treat that happens October 28th. Also, some people asked, when do we need the money? It, you know, at some point we're going to purchase all that stuff, so we're just going to pay off the credit card with the donations that come in, so it doesn't really matter when those donations come in. Um, the best of Bloomingdale, well, Pam says it does matter, but, um, <laughs> so the sooner rather than later, okay, <laughs> yes. Best of Bloomingdale is still going on. Um, that happens uh, until the 15th. The voting is open until the 15th, so this week yet. Thank you, thank you, thank you to everybody who has been voting. Um, there was, I don't know if you saw my post, but there was a, a, an email that went out from the chamber this week, and the, the races are very tight because they have had record voting. So that is great. Thank you to everybody who's been voting. I don't know if that means anything positive for us, but the races are tight. So um, thank you. Please keep voting. You can vote once a day. And remember, um, it used to be you could vote per device. It's apparently now per email address, but you can vote once once a day, vote early, vote often. Um, congregational conversation. Uh, next Sunday, uh, the 17th of September, is a busy day in the life of the church again. Um, after worship, we will have uh, probably a short, um, uh, just congregational conversation, an opportunity for us to let everybody know where we stand financially uh, as we are in the third quarter of the fiscal year, as we look forward to the fourth quarter of the fiscal, fiscal year. Um, we think it's a good time for us to do that. I mean, yes, the reality is everything has been sometimes 200, 300% more expensive than we were expecting. So, you know, the news is not exactly 
amazing. Um, it's not horrific, but it is not amazing. Um, but the reality is we want you to know where we stand, especially as you start to think about things like year-end giving, um, tax situation, giving, all that kind of stuff. So please join us uh, after worship next Sunday so we can uh, fill you in on the financial status of our congregation. Um, we're hoping like 25 to 30 minutes uh, at most. Then we would love you to come back at 3 o'clock in the afternoon for our worship team uh, concert, which we are very excited about. Uh, rehearsal has been going great for that. Uh, and uh, we're, we just think it's going to be a beautiful afternoon of music and celebration of the Lord. Um, and then uh, afterwards, we're going to have cookies and fellowship, and it'll just be a very nice afternoon. Uh, please invite your neighbors and your friends. This is a, uh, you know, other than donating towards the cause of the Maui uh, relief. This is a totally free afternoon. It's a great opportunity to invite friends to see what the life of this church is like. That happens next Sunday, 3 p.m. Uh, for the worship team concert. And then finally, we want to remind you that we have Feed My Starving Children, and our next opportunity takes place uh, Saturday, September 30th. Our slotted time for um, volunteering starts at 11.30 at the Schomburg location. Uh, we would need you to be there by about 11.15, um, and we go until, is it 1 o'clock, Jennifer? Yeah, till 1 o'clock. Um, so please, if you have not had a chance to sign up, you can sign up at the information center in between the bathrooms and the welcome center uh, today. Um, the sooner you sign up, the better, so that we can get you in the system and get you the reminders and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think that those are all of the um, updates. I have neither of my people, neither Jill nor Jeannie are here today, but I believe those are all of the updates that I'm supposed to give you today. So Jen says yes. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Perfect. Uh, in your bulletin, you will also uh, see that there is uh, some prayer uh, requests that are there. Um, and because they're sitting far, far enough forward that people can see them on Facebook anyways, we can give a shout of praise that Jana is in the house of the Lord this morning. <laughs> And I, I know that everybody's wondering, no, she did not ride a four-wheeler here this morning. <laughs> but we give thanks for everything that the Lord has done to keep you guys safe and traveling back here. And we're glad that you're home safe. Yes. Yeah, right. Yes. That's right. She says it's because they missed us. It's really because they want ice cream. That's why they're here. So. <laughs> By the pastor, yes. There are other, there are many other uh, prayer requests in your bulletin this morning. Um, please be sure to take note of those things and put them in a place where you will see them this week. But would you please just join us in a general word of prayer this morning? Father, we do pause now to lay before you the needs and the concerns and the joys of this church. And Father, you are proving to us each and every single day that you do hear the prayers of your people. That when crisis strikes, that when people are sick, when surgeries come, when people are grieving the loss of a loved one, when there are needs of many different kinds, financial, spiritual, emotional, you hear the prayers of your people and you provide for us. You care for us. You love us. You heal us. And so, Father, we give you thanks this morning for hearing our prayers. We give you thanks that we have this opportunity to lay these people before you to ask you once again to be the great healer, the great restorer. We give you thanks that we have the opportunity to ask you to provide, to bring comfort and peace to those who grieve and who mourn. Father, there are so many needs. There are the needs that we have named before you this morning and there are the needs that we only name before you in our hearts. 
But your word tells us that whether we've spoken them aloud or we've only spoken them to you, you know them. And Father, you're already working. You're already working for the good of those who love you. And we praise you for that. And Father, we praise you for this place that you have called Cornerstone Faith Community Church. And for this family. And for all who gather and worship here. And Father, we praise you for our children. And for our Sunday school. And for the opportunity that we have to to reach into the lives of the next generation of believers in this place. And and Father, we praise you that we have a reason to to reopen our toddler room. And we praise you that we have people who are willing to help. Father, what you are doing in the life of this church to, to stir up life, we can only stand back in amazement and say thank you. And so, Father, now, as we turn our hearts to your word, we ask that you would, once again, give us the wisdom and the discernment of your Holy Spirit. That as we hear the word you have for us, you would speak to our hearts, that it would fall fresh on our hearts, that we would hear afresh from you, and that we would apply this word to our hearts and our lives. We ask all of this in Jesus' precious and holy name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.
Well, brothers and sisters, would you please stand for the reading of God, of God's word <laughs> this morning? That as we read God's word, it would fall fresh on our hearts and on our minds. This morning we continue our look at Jesus' words to the Apostle John, in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word for this day. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, brothers and sisters, I imagine that at some point, each and every one of us has all been a, in a situation where someone has said to us, well, I, I have some good news and I have some bad news. How many of you have been in a situation like that? Somebody said, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. Now, when you find yourself in a situation like that, I'm curious, how many of you would prefer to hear the good news first? Okay. How many of you prefer to hear the bad news first? Oh, interesting. Okay. A woman was recently visiting with her doctor after having had a series of lengthy tests and scans completed. The doctor entered into her room and said to her, well, I have good news and I have bad news. The woman said, well, I am really scared to hear the bad news, so please, doctor, give me the good news first. The doctor says, oh, okay, well, the good news is you have 24 hours to live. She says, what? In shock, she replied, what? How can the fact that I only have 24 hours to live possibly be the good news? The doctor looked at her and said, well, my secretary has been trying to reach you since yesterday. <laughs> That's the bad news. Sometimes we are faced with the task of giving news to someone that does not necessarily fulfill both the categories of good and bad. Sometimes the news is good news and it just keeps getting better. Sometimes the news is bad and it just keeps getting worse. When I was in second grade, my grandfather, my father's father, went into the hospital to have his gallbladder removed. As it turned out, that surgery apparently was more than his body could sustain. So he ended up passing away a short time after that while he was in the hospital. That was the bad news. Now the news got a little bit worse because our next door neighbor at the time 
also ended up going into the hospital at exactly the same time. Now, this next-door neighbor was like a grandfather to myself and my family. And he, unfortunately, ended up passing away at almost exactly the same time. And if memory serves right, we had the visitation for my grandfather on one day and the funeral the next, and then the visitation for the next-door neighbor on the next day, and then the funeral the next. Bad news became worse. In some ways, that's the situation that unfolds in Sardis as we listen to the words of warning that Jesus has for the church here. You see, in Sardis, along with Laodicea, they only receive negative criticism from Jesus. Jesus has nothing positive to say about the church in Sardis. Let me give you a little background on Sardis. Sardis is a mountaintop city. It's about 30 to 40 miles southeast of Thyatira. In case you haven't figured it out, we're making a big circle, okay, uh, as we go through these seven cities. We've gone north. Now we're starting to circle back to the south. Uh, the mountain on which Sardis sat served as sort of a citadel or a guardian place, keeping the city safe from its coming enemies. Uh, Sardis... Similarly to Laodicea, was very famous for its wealth. It is nearly exactly the opposite of that town Thyatira that we talked about last week. The Patulis River which is notable for being loaded with gold deposits, flows immediately next to Sardis. In fact, that Petulus River is said to have been the place that is so loaded with gold deposits because that's supposedly where King Midas went and dipped his fingers to get rid of that dreaded golden touch. This is not a blue-collar working community. This is not one of those trade guild towns. This is a wealthy, aristocratic town filled with old money, people who were very, very comfortable with their lives, people who were very, very self-sufficient. And that's where the problem comes for Sardis. They were wealthy enough that they had very little need to rely on anyone other than themselves, including God. The people of Sardis were more in tune with their riches and their wealth than they were their need for a savior. This was a wealthy church. It probably had all of the great things that gold could buy, whatever those great things were of that day. But Jesus asked this church one simple question, and it had nothing to do with the church's bank account or the size of its building, its campus, whether it had an east campus and a west campus or a downtown campus and a suburban campus. He didn't care how modern the church was. The question Jesus asked the church at Sardis was, are you alive or are you dead? Pastor Tony Evans said that this church had a reputation for being alive. It was the kind of place about which people today might say, they have great music, and man, do they have good preaching. Yet because Jesus knew their works, he saw there was no true spiritual life there. They were merely playing church. Now, brothers and sisters, that kind of hurts because it kind of hits close to home. Because I think we have really great music. I want to be biased and say we have really great music. I have been told that the preaching is okay. <laughs> but Tony Evans seems to be suggesting that great music and great preaching is not enough to call ourselves alive. Then what is? What is it that keeps the church from merely playing church? Dr. Warren Wearsby, he says, the church had a reputation without reality. 
form without force. Like the city itself, the church at Sardis was glorying in past splendor, but ignoring present decay. You know what that sounds like? We used to have the best Sunday school in town. We used to have the biggest choir you've ever seen. Reputation without reality, form without force, past splendor, present decay, bad news, worse news, even worse news. What Dr. Wearsby means by reputation without reality and form without force is that the church looked great, but at the end of the day, as we all know, looks can be deceiving. From the outside, everything seemed great. It was a huge building. It was modern. It had modern amenities. It had ample parking. It had lush, manicured grounds. Everything was great. Once you walked through the doors, things seemed to be perfect. It had a huge auditorium, stadium seating, filled to capacity, lights, smoke machines, everything you could ever imagine and want, new technology, jumbotrons. The pastor was a hit. And when you went to the church bookstore after church, his books were flying off the shelves. They couldn't keep them in stock. But Jesus wasn't asking about manicured lawns, sanctuaries as big as a football field. He wasn't interested in knowing how many books the pastor had written or if his name appeared on the New York Best Time Seller list. Jesus wanted to know something so much more simple than this. He just simply wanted to know, church, do you remember what you first heard from me? What you first received from me? Because it seems like you've almost forgotten. It seems like you're almost dead. And more than just asking the church if they remembered what he had first given to them, Jesus called to them now. He says, now, before it is too late, you got to run away from all of these things that have taken your attention away from me. Get it back on to the things that really matter. Me. You got you to start to think about the deeds you've left unfinished. It's almost like Jesus says there's a little bit of flame still left in this church, but it's a matter of right now. We've got to get back to the flame right now. We've got to stoke the flame right now before it's too late and that flame completely goes out. So today I want to share with you three lessons that we can learn, church. Cornerstone Faith Community Church that we can learn from Sardis. And the first one is this. They appeared to be alive from the outside. But on the inside, they were as good as dead. They appeared to be alive on the outside, but in the inside, they were as good as dead. The church was physically alive, but spiritually dead. I need to preface this by saying, I don't think we're spiritually dead. As a matter of fact, as I've already said this morning, I think we're more spiritually alive now than we maybe have ever been. Praise God for that. When I was in college, one class that was required of every freshman student was a class called Survey of the New Testament. It was as terrible as it sounded. Um, (laughs) There was a joke that for as long as the college had been in existence, the same professor had been teaching that class. Truthfully, there were many times that I wondered if that actually wasn't a joke. Now, bear in mind, I was in college, uh, I started college as a freshman in 2001. Um... At that time, it was pretty common that every student had a computer in their dorm room, but it was not yet common that every student had a laptop to take with them to class. And certainly no one had iPads. Those were way too expensive. We still took notes the old-fashioned way, with a notebook and a pen. Most of the other professors on campus had technology they were starting to implement in their classes. They were using these fancy things called PowerPoint slides. Not this professor. 
He gave us outlines that he had handwritten on a legal pad and then had his TA photocopy for us. Every day when he would walk into class, I kid you not, he would wear the exact same brown suit with the exact same shirt and tie. As the weather got colder, he would add a sweater to the same suit, shirt, and tie. As plain and boring as that was, his teaching style was no better. His voice was completely monotone. His laugh was like this, ha, 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 ha. Many of us would comment to each other during class, we would say, I wonder if he is some sort of robot, because there is no way that this man is actually alive. From the outside, we could see him moving, we could see him speaking and teaching, but he just simply seemed like he was dead on the inside. It was as, almost as if there was no life left in him. That's Jesus' concern with Sardis. Although it looked like they were walking and moving and going through the motions, they, they were half dead. Sardis gave the appearance that they were maybe alive and well from the outside, but they were half dead. Jesus gives the sense that the second we would walk through the doors of the Sardis church, everything changes. On the outside, it appeared as if there was life, but on the inside, there was literally nothing happening. It was dead. How does that happen? How does a church look so good from the outside, but on the inside, how can it be so dead? Bill McDonald says that Sardis had a reputation as a Christian assembly, but for the most part, it simply went through formal, dull routine. It did not overflow with spiritual life. It did not sparkle with the supernatural. I think they probably didn't have enough balloon praise parades, in my opinion. <laughs> what we do as a family of God, as the people of God, as the church of Jesus Christ here on earth that gathers together in Bloomingdale, Illinois, it has to be more than a formal dull routine. Church has to be more than just something that we get up and do on Sunday morning. Church has to be something that we get up and do every single day, every single moment. You see, when we have the opportunity to help someone, we have the opportunity to be the church. When we have the opportunity to love someone, we have the opportunity to be the church. When we have the opportunity to serve someone, we have the opportunity to be the church. When we have the opportunity to speak the truth, we have the opportunity to be the church. And when we have the opportunity to remain humble instead of raising our voices and ra acting rashly, we have the opportunity to be the church. So let me tell you how many of those opportunities present themselves at times other than when your butts are sitting in these pews on Sunday morning. How many of those moments have been outside of these walls? Guess what? The answer is all of them. We don't want to be a church that just looks like it's alive, right? We have to be a church that is truly alive. Because here's the reason why. Jesus said that there were some in Sardis who didn't soil their clothes like the others in Sardis did. And those people, the ones who were truly alive, who didn't just look like they were, but were truly alive, they were going to be dressed in white with him. They were just alive on the inside as they looked like they were on the outside. They weren't just walking the walk and trying to talk the talk to look like they were Christians. They believed it and they lived it. And they were going to be with Jesus forever, dressed in white right beside him. The second thing we can take away from Sardis today then is this. The Sardis church, they had left many deeds unfinished. They had left many deeds unfinished, which basically means this. The church had started something for God, but they had not seen it through to its completion. 
They had not seen it through to its completion. Nothing drives me more crazy than to leave a project unfinished. Right, Dale? Right, Barb? Barb calls, when are you coming home? We're not done yet. Jeremy didn't say we're done yet. There have been projects around here that we have had from time to time leave unfinished. We were unable to complete the project for this reason or that. So we had to step away from it for a while. But every time I walk past that project, and by the way, here's a little secret. Every time my friend Dale walks by it, he does the same thing. We go, oh, we've got to finish that project. Sometimes those projects are unfinished beyond our control. Perhaps the next step of the project is just too costly for the budget right now. Perhaps what we need to finish that project is backordered. It's unavailable at the time. Sometimes the, the time just isn't available to finish the project. But other times we step away from projects in our lives. We have the best of intentions to finish them, but we don't. We prioritize other things. Other stuff gets in the way. For just a little bit more perspective on the matter of unfinished deeds before our God, I want to take a look at how the King James Version of the Bible translates this passage that that we're reading today. So in the NIV, it said, Jesus said, Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. That's what we read this morning. But look at the King James. It says, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. Now listen to this. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. That's a little different than unfinished, isn't it? Bible commentator Matthew Henry suggests that the unfinished deed or the imperfect work of the Sardis church was as simple as the fact that they had left their guard down. They had failed at keeping their watch over the things of Christ, the things that he had first given them. And if they weren't careful, they were sure to lose them completely. That sounds an awful lot like the first church we talked about. Remember Ephesus? When Jesus said, you've forgotten your first love, me. I've given a great deal of thought about the unfinished deeds of the church, particular the unfinished deeds of this church, our church. What are those deeds and and how do they happen? And most importantly, how can we avoid them? I agree with Matthew Henry. I think that the unfinished work of this church is probably less things that have gone undone and more the imperfection or the incompletion of our work. We've done great work, but there's still so much more to do. I would encourage us to this end then, that when Jesus comes... Do we want him to see our ministry and our work as being, well, we tried hard? Or as we saw it through to the very end? That when he comes, we say, he will say, that task is now complete. You remember Philippians chapter 1, verses 4 through 6? It says, In all of my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began the good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. Who who brings it to completion? Jesus. John 15, 9 through 11. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. Now watch this. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. What completes the job? What completes the joy? Finishing the commands of Jesus. Acts 20 and In 24, however I consider my life worth nothing to me, my only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. Whose task? The Lord Jesus' task, the one he has given us. 1 Corinthians 13, 9 through 10, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, 
what is in part disappears. Who brings completeness when it comes with Jesus? Brothers and sisters, Christ has started something in this place, hasn't he? Isn't this morning evidence enough for us that Christ has started something in this place? So let us not be the ones who are going to stand in the way of him bringing it to completion. Amen? Amen. Third thing, very quickly, that we can take away from Sardis. If the church does not wake up, Christ will come like a thief. If the church does not wake up, Christ will come like a thief. Those who are eagerly expecting Jesus will find his coming to be a welcomed surprise. So if gaining heaven's white robes of righteousness and walking with Christ forever and completing what Christ has already begun was not motivation enough for us to learn from Sardis' alive on the outside and dead on the inside way of life, then I think verses 3 and 5 of our text today should be enough motivation for us. He says this in verse 3. If you don't wake up, I'll come like a thief. You'll have no idea when I'm coming. And in verse 5, he says, the one who is victorious will like them be dressed in white. I will never blot that name out of the book of life. That means by process of elimination, this. The one who is not victorious, the one who does not wake up, the one who does not repent, the one who leaves Christ's work unfinished, will be sorry to discover that when Christ comes, he has come under the darkness of night, without disturbance, having never been noticed, just like a thief who has robbed your home. And guess what? He will have come in and he will have gone out and it will be too late. It will be too late. What really makes my mind spin is this. The one who is victorious, Christ promises that their name will never ever be blotted out of the Lamb's book of life. That means two things. At some point, every single person's name, regardless of their terrible and tragic life choices, every single person's name at some point was written down in the Lamb's book of life. At some point, every name was there. But it also means this. Some names have been or will be blotted out, erased. This is where those terrible and tragic life choices come into play. But it is the truth that even with those terrible and tragic life choices, that there is still repentance, there is still forgiveness. So the only thing that really brings about the blotting out of a person's name from the Lamb's book of life is rejection and refusal. Rejection of Christ and refusal to repent. You see, in Roman uh, cities, there was this thing called a register. Every Roman city had a register. Once a person was deemed a citizen of that city, they were had their name written in the book, the register. That name would stay there until that person died. But sometimes their names could be blotted out of that book. What would cause their name to be blotted out of the book? Only two things. One would be they would die. The other would be they were a criminal. They were a criminal. And even if they became a criminal, if they went to jail and they served their time, okay, name's back in the book. But if they refused to go to jail, if they refused to admit their crime, their name was blotted out of the book, no longer a citizen of Rome. The only thing that prevents your name from being blotted out of the Lamb's book of life is earnest and heartfelt repentance. To Jesus Christ, he is the only one who can stop the blotting out. 
Those who did not soil their clothes with the sin stains of Sardis, those who did hear what Jesus had to say, who did wake up, who did strengthen what remained before the church completely died. Jesus said to them, you now have permanent citizenship in heaven. Your name is forever written in the Lamb's book of life. You will wear a robe of white with me. You will walk the streets of gold with me. And that will never change. Here's the thing. Jesus is coming, right? He is coming soon, right? For those who are still asleep, who are merely walking through the motions, who merely appear to be alive on the outside, but in the inside are completely dead, Christ has promised that he will come as a thief in the night. He will come unannounced, stealthily, without ever disturbing them, and then it will be too late. But for those who, as the end of this text said, have ears to hear what the Spirit says to the churches, by the way, that's us. For those who are willing to wake up and strengthen what remains before it dies. For those who are vigilant to assure that what Christ has begun, we will see through to completion when he comes. For those who, as Christ says, are victorious. There is the promise of a robe, white, and the name forever in the Lamb's book of life. That is enough for me to want to be a church that is truly alive. Not just looking like we're alive. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you for this word. It is a hard word, Father. It is a difficult time when we are only hearing criticism. But Father, so often we need it. We need to be reminded to wake up. That it is not okay to merely look alive on the outside. We must be alive. So Father, protect us. Protect us from the fake living that is so often part of this world. And help us to always be fully earnestly, truly alive in you. Knowing that it is you who has begun the good work in this place and it is you who will see it through to completion when your son, Jesus Christ, comes again. Father, we thank you for this in his name. Amen. Please stand and sing with us.
Well, brothers and sisters, I think it is an important warning from Jesus that we would wake up, right? That we would be reminded that uh, everything the world sees about us is critically important. But so often, the world only sees the outside. Our job is for the world to see the inside. That we truly are alive for Christ Jesus in every single way. We don't just walk through the motions. We don't just talk a good story. We actually walk the walk of Jesus Christ, and we talk the talk of Jesus Christ, and we live the life of Jesus Christ every single day. That Cornerstone Faith Community Church is truly alive for Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Go then with the love of God our Father, the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, and the power and presence of the Holy Spirit to be yours this day and forevermore. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Please join us down in the Beacon Room for that giant ice cream sundae. Give them a.